Welcome to the eighth annual lecture of the Humanitarian Policy Group, which tonight is titled Challenging the Humanitarian Status Quo a Gender Equality Revolution. I'm Sara Pantuliano. I am the newly appointed executive director here to the I, day four, in the job today. I'm really delighted to welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to welcome everyone that is in the room today, but also to the very numerous online audience. Um, welcome, you know, we'll try and bring you into the conversation later on. For those in the room, please put your phone on silent, but do engage in the Twitter conversation. The hashtag is HPG Lecture. Now, the HPG Lecture is an event that we host every year, and it's really, you know, delivered by a senior figure on a leading humanitarian issue. Um, we've had many, you know, distinguished guests in the past, <coughs> to name a few. Um, Karen Abuzaid, the former UN Special Advisor on Refugees and Migrants. Ambassador Hisham Yusuf, the former Assistant Secretary General of the Organization for Islamic Cooperation. And Yves Dacord, the Director General of the ICRC. But tonight, I have the pleasure of welcoming Her Royal Highness, Princess Sarah Zaid of Jordan. To that distinguished. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we, we're going better and better every year. Let me tell you why I'm really excited to have Princess Sarah with us tonight. Um, I don't know if she does everything that she does, but she is an incredible advocate for maternal, newborn, child, and adolescent health rights and well-being particularly in humanitarian and fragile setting. And that's an issue that for us is really important here to the eye and something on which the humanitarian policy group is focusing more and more. <laughs> Princess Sarah has funded and led every woman, every child, everywhere. That's a really important global multi-stakeholder movement that is aimed to integrate humanitarian and fragile settings into the very well-established global strategy for women, children, and adoles adolescent health. That was a roadmap that was adopted by the World Health Assembly to end all preventable deaths of women, children, and adolescents by 2030. But that's not the only thing she does. On the contrary, she's a member of the advisory board for the Women's Rights Division and Human Rights, Work, uh, Human Rights Watch. Sorry. She is a patron for UNHCR for maternal and newborn health. She's also a member of the UNHCR's advisory group on gender, forced displacement, and protection. Princess Sarah also serves on the Health Advisory Committee of John Sopsing Center for Humanitarian Health. She's a special advisor to the World Food Program on Maternal and Child Health and Nutrition and a convener of the Newborn Health and Humanitarian Settings Initiative. And yes, she does also sleep. Don't know when, though. <laughs> so thank you so much for being with us tonight, taking time into your very busy schedule to address such a critical issue and lend your voice to something that is so critical um, for all of us. But I'm also pleased to introduce tonight the new head of the Humanitarian Policy Group, Sorsha O'Callaghan, uh, who is also very new in the job, just three weeks. Um, Sorsha will lead the conversation with Princess Sarah tonight. Um, she's joined us as an old friend of ODI. She's you know, returned to us where she worked many years ago um, in the Humanitarian Policy Group, and where she led the protection of civilians work, um, then you know, um, went to be the head of policy at the British Red Cross, and on um, to Nairobi, where she has led work as a, you know, an independent consultant on migration and displacement issues in East Africa. We're really proud to have you back <laughs> at ODI, leading HPG. Um, and I'm really looking forward to your conversation tonight with Princess Sarah. Thank you very much, both of you. So I'm just going to say a few words. And thank you so much, Sarah, for the warm welcome. And a really warm welcome also to you, Princess Sarah. And it, it really is great to be back in ODI. Um, and I'm so excited. We've had a long day here today with our fabulous advisory group and the energy in the room um, and the dynamism and the, I guess the vision that HPG has for the next few years is just so exciting. Um, and part of that is a project that we're doing on gender dynamics in displacement. Um, and this work in HPG builds on long-standing uh, work and research across the Institute on Gender and uh, Development. And so this topic tonight couldn't be more relevant to us, but it also couldn't be more timely. And we all know that women and girls faced 
particular issues in natural disasters and crises. They face increased gender-based violence, disruptions to essential services, sexual and reproductive health services, and yet moments of crisis can also create moments of opportunity for girls and women's leadership, and which supported and if sustained can drive longer term gains in girls and women's equality and progress for all. And as Sarah said, Sarah, or Princess Sarah has been a passionate advocate to these issues. She's been advocated on the issues of addressing maternal and newborn health in humanitarian crises. She's been a champion of the vital needs to protect women and girls from gender-based violence. And she's here tonight to not just advocate for a transformation in gender equality, but for a transformation in the humanitarian system that can truly put women and girls at the center. So without further ado, I give you Princess Sarah Zaid. Welcome. Thank you. It's much more comfortable sitting and listening, <laughs> I'm afraid, than standing up here. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sosha, for your very kind introduction. I really am deeply honored to have been asked to speak this evening before such an august gathering and feel very privileged to have this opportunity. I've always been a great proponent of speaking to the unconverted and expanding knowledge about the realities, opportunities and challenges in the humanitarian sector to new groups and audiences. But not, I realize, because it's the right thing to do, but because it's the easier thing to do. Laying bare my opinions and experiences to all of you, respected practitioners, experts, humanitarians, colleagues, budget holders, and friends. It's very intimidating. I'm looking at you, Valerie. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also rather sad. Sitting as we are on the cusp of 2020, I wish we were here to celebrate, that we could cheer a job well done, that we really were at the last mile, leaving no one behind. Instead, tragically, what is required is a deep breath renewed commitment, and for us to dive bare-knuckled, courageous, and more determined than ever, ever into the fight to do more, for more, and to do it better. Rising sea levels, extreme weather events, and prolonged drought have affected millions, and an estimated 70.8 million people are forcibly displaced, uprooted by conflict and crisis, forced to leave their homes, lands, livelihoods, and traditions. While one segment of society is dreaming of life on Mars, over 113 others are facing acute hunger and dreaming of food. And the resulting unbroken cycle of poverty, malnutrition, poor education and insecurity have a disproportionate impact on women and girls. The Prime Minister of Fiji, in a bruising speech about the devastation brought to the Pacific Island countries by climate change, called the cohort of an action to overcome it the coalition of the selfish. A coalition of the selfish surely brought about by a toxic blend of narrow-minded, short-term national self-interest or political expediency, eclipsing the global interest, the interest of every human. The result? A world gone mad, where climate change, contagion, and conflict are multiplying and converging into a tempest. We here must be the other. We must be the just, the bold, and maybe the slightly crazy. We have to think and act differently with an urgency to prioritize the people who need us the most and invest in their survival, growth, and well-being. To do this, to do better, we need a revolution. The humanitarian architecture as it exists today is fundamentally flawed. It was not designed nor been able to adjust to populations living as refugees displaced for almost 20 years. Not designed to provide comprehensive health care, education, water and sanitation facilities, energy, livelihood, foods and nutrition to millions for decades. In 2018, the average length of ICRC's presence in its 10 largest operations was 37 years. 37 years, that's longer than the MDGs and the SDGs combined. ICRC's 2019 appeal is for over $2 billion, an increase of more than 80% compared to their 2010 budget. The number of refugees under UNHCR's care has almost doubled 
since just 2012. With the staggering increase of need and the numbers of years support is needed, so seemingly has attention and discussion. Yet despite the resulting decades of discourse, conferences, reports, declarations, commitments, summits, and hard work, the structure that exists to assist, support, mitigate, and prevent are in fact little changed. The impact of this systemic inertia is compounded by multiple ingrained layers of division and competition between organizations and thematic sectors. Crudely put, for example, a woman and all she cares about and is responsible for has been boxed into a multitude of segments and responsibility of each divvied up. Her stomach has gone to WFP, her ovaries to UNFPA, her children to UNICEF, employment and voice to UN Women, vaccines to Gavi, and her crops and animals to FAO. <laughs> if she lives in a setting with a stable and benign government, these needs are cared for by one lot of people. When dis disaster strikes, however, a completely different group with different priorities, financial mechanisms, and even different acronyms move in. Worse still, these groups generally do not know one another or have mechanisms for collaborating. The false dichotomy between humanitarian and development makes no sense. My needs as a woman and mother of three might increase or diminish based on the changing nature of my surroundings, be they war or peace, feast or famine, but they are not so dramatically transformed as to justify the siloed manner in which we continue to program and fund. Revolutions are about changing power structures, and they will not be achieved by the same players continuing to wield the same power in the same way as they always have. So what do we need to do? I have three key pillars of transformation to propose. Evidence shows that when women are included in humanitarian action, their entire community benefits with a cascading effect for generations to come. First, therefore, we prioritize and invest in women and girls, the entirety of their health and well-being and all they care about and are responsible for. Women and girls whose lives have been affected by violence and conflict and who live in fragile settings, who are the first responders to shocks, be they man-made or mother nature, and are the first line of defense for children, families, and communities. Women and girls who are the heart and backbone of our families and communities, and who with their health, dignity, and rights assured, lay the foundation for long-term development and economic growth, peace, and security. Second, long-term, predictable, flexible financing. Where it is needed, when it is needed, being used on what is most needed, and in the hands of those most in need. Substantial increases in funding are extremely unlikely in the current climate, which means doing better with what we have. It means using existing funds more efficiently, exploring alternative forms of finance and investing in the local and national organizations closest to the needs and experience of women and girls in crisis. A little side note, if I may, about the current climate. In response to Mark Lowcock's announcement at the release of the Global Humanitarian Overview that 29 billion, and I find things with a B make me nervous, 29 billion is required to meet the needs of the 109 million most vulnerable people targeted for support in 2020. Jan Egland reminded us that the 29 billion is only half the size of the global ice cream market. Jan's next question, so why is saving lives less well-funded than eating ice cream, I think requires serious and honest contemplation. Currency. Power over core humanitarian decision-making comes from the donors, who both define overarching resource allocation across agencies and emergencies, and also serve on the governing boards of the multilateral aid agencies receiving the lion's share of funding. When decision-making takes place in spaces dominated by international donors and aid agencies, 
the influence and financing of civil society organizations or an affected community is peripheral at best. OCHA's financial tracking service cites local and national actors being allocated a mere 8.7% of global humanitarian funding in 2018, and only 2% of the total reported multi-year contributions. National NGOs and civil society, as a result, are boxed into cycles of unpredictable short-term and project-based funding with minimal core funds to support overheads, staff salary costs, capacity strengthening, and organizational sustainability. And they, like international NGOs and the UN, focus their activities on donor interests, which largely reflect donor national agendas and domestic politics. We follow the money, not the need. The current emphasis on women's empowerment and investing in women's activities, for example, whether through microloans, entrepreneurship training, livestock or scholarships, has little to do with the kind of collective action needed to transform power relations. By investing in the individual, the burden remains on women to lift themselves and their children out of poverty while leaving in place the very systems of oppression that cause or contribute to this poverty in the first place. The efficacy and impact of all interventions are in fact undermined without sustained levels of predictable, finance, predictable flexible financing. And it is almost impossible to plan and execute integrated humanitarian response activities and achieve a holistic, person-centered, women-centered approach. Lack of scope for course corrections, adjustments for lead times, and the ability to respond to sudden shocks and shortfalls. School enro enrollments drop because school feeding programs run out of funds. Girls can lose a week of schooling per month because sanitary products are not provided or sanitary facilities are not available. Lack of public lighting in refugee camps increases risks to women and girls and decreases their ability to study and work after dark. The health and well-being of women is undermined by anemia because the micronutrients she needs have been overlooked or behavior change in communication around diet diversity not included or made culturally and context specific. My third and last revolutionary pillar is guided by a song. It's one my husband made reference to when he was human rights high commissioner called Everybody Knows by Leonard Cohen. And please don't tell him that I'm using this because then he might think, <laughs> well, he might think then that I was actually paying attention and, and that just wouldn't do. Everybody knows. In the last 30 years, hard work, innovation, insight, investment and determination have driven tremendous progress for people around the world. Just not all people. Global under five mortality levels, for example, have been reduced and millions of lives saved, but it, has not, but it has been happening in a massively unbalanced way. Newborn mortality is not in decline and now accounts for almost half of under five deaths. In other words, of the preventable 5.3 million under five deaths, half of them occur in the first 28 days of their little lives. And this figure does not include the estimated 2.6 million stillbirths every year, over a third of those happening during labor and delivery. Newborn mortality, morbidity, and stillbirths, however, are not a priority. Last year, 29 million babies were born into conflict-affected areas, and 35 million women and girls of reproductive age are in need of humanitarian assistance. But the international standards that define emergency obstetrical care and newborn care are amongst the most poorly funded and poorly provided components of humanitarian assistance, despite this enormous burden. Current predictions suggest that it will be more than a century until African newborns have the same survival chance as a baby born here in the UK. And a woman or girl in sub-Saharan Africa is 50 times more likely to die during pregnancy and childbirth than one in a high-income country. 
we know we are not hearing the needs of every woman, every child, every newborn, everywhere. Everybody knows, as we mark the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, that in conflict, women and girls face increased risks of multiple forms of gender-based violence, unplanned pregnancies, death or disability during pregnancy and childbirth, unsafe abortion, and sexually transmitted infections. It is also when access to non-discriminatory and comprehensive health services can be truly life-saving, including sexual and reproductive health services, mental health and psychosocial support, legal assistance and access to justice. However, currently, only 3 to 4% of all humanitarian spending goes to protection activities, and only around 0.5% is spent on GBV services. The bulk of these funds go to UN agencies and international NGOs, and the smallest portion to national NGOs, and within that, even smaller the portion that goes to women-led organizations. Everybody knows. Women Deliver and Partners published the investment case for women and girls, calculating the economics of, amongst other things, scaling up nutrition interventions for pregnant women and children. A $16 return. Sexual and reproductive health services and meeting the need for modern contraceptives. A $120 return. And showed that the investment in the elimination of gender-based violence is one of the most cost-effective SDG targets, while the cost of inaction a whopping $66 billion. We know where the needs are greatest and most urgent, what is best value for money, and how to end preventable deaths, injury, and the pain they cause. The outgoing Secretary General of the IFRC said recently, we need to instill hope in places where despair is the norm. We need to be humble to listen and learn. We need to lead in an inclusive way without leaving anybody behind. And while we don't take sides, we do take a stand. Distinguished colleagues, friends, I am taking a stand and I am taking a side. I am standing for and with the women girls, newborns and children living in the hardest of places at the toughest of times, who are being lost to an inescapable cycle of ill health, poverty, dependency and death. I am standing on the side of and standing for systemic change so that they and their communities can move from a culture of assistance and benevolence to a culture that recognizes the centrality of people's rights, the rights of men, women, girls and boys. I am taking a side and taking a stand for unfettered access, accountability and the rule of law. And I am taking a side and I am standing with all of you who are committed to make a change and to be the change that we so desperately need. Thank you. A great challenge to throw out to all of us so thank you and before I open up to the floor for yeah for comments for contributions and for further engagement I have a few questions um, and I think the first thing that strikes me but maybe this is something we can we can discuss discuss more broadly is that you really challenge us in terms of what actually is humanitarian action for is it about just responding to crises to this small, short-term, relief-oriented <coughs> exercise, or is it actually about true transformation? And I think what you're talking about is transformation of the entire humanitarian sector, about what it's oriented at, you know, what, what are its interests, what are its priorities, but also who do we recognize as uh, a humanitarian actor? You know, is it just the international actors, or is it national actors, or is it the women's group that we all know are present in all of these contexts? But maybe before we open up to those bigger issues. I had a few questions for you. And the first is that we're, we're in a moment where there's, I think, largely unprecedented attention to women's issues and to gender equality. Um, and we're seeing that you know, in many 
guises across the world. But we're also seeing a backlash against, you know, so it's in turn has generated a backlash. And so how do we take advantage of this global attention to drive the donor interests and to make sure that we are prioritizing the issues that you're talking about? And how do we stop the backlash? So, you know, you're talking about these politics and these interests that are driving funding. Mm. But actually, there's an opportunity at the moment to direct that interest so that we, we can change some of the politics. But what do you, what do you think about that? I think that's a horrible question. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and that almost anybody else, uh, particularly the donors in the room, um, uh, might be better served um, to answer that. Because, mm -hmm. as I said, we know. Yeah. So why why isn't this taking root? Why aren't donors yeah. more more engaged, more mm -hmm. active? Um, uh, why do we not challenge yeah. more? Yeah. Um, the, yeah. Um, uh, the the thing that that comes to mind is mm -hmm. the um, uh, the Germans, um, and I am going to name names. The Germans <laughs> um, uh, when they were president of the Security mm. Council. Uh, held a an event around um, sexual violence mm -hmm. in conflict, and um, you know, wonderful idea. It had the the two Nobel Peace Prize recipients, Amal Clooney was there. It was a who's who thing. They opened up the curtains behind mm -hmm. the Security Council, which hadn't been done in forty years, um, and um, uh, but of course, the real story is that is the pushback on women's health and rights. And, um, and please correct me if I've got it wrong. The Americans wanted to take out the word sexual reproductive mm. health mm -hmm. from the document. Words that have been you know, part of, of UN um, jargon for years. Um, that uh, in Women, Peace and Security recently, the, the Russians objected to a focus on gender yeah. and these sorts of things. So the real power These, holders are blocking yes. the progress. And even though we have this attention, it's actually not moving things forward. Uh, or it's, it's not moving things forward where it matters. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so, so you have the street. You have um, the, the pink hat movement mm. that came out in, in New York uh, or across the US when Trump was elected and, um, uh, and women were out on the streets um, and so on. Is it that we've, we've sort of lost interest um, and, and so we're not continuing to push mm -hmm. these issues even as, as rights are being rolled back domestically, internationally? Mm -hmm. um, is it that we don't know how to mobilize and, and actually make a difference? At, Is it that at it's that a woman's level? led agenda? I mean, we t you talk powerfully about women and girls and giving agency and voice to women and girls. But I guess the question that I would have is how do we bring men? into this as allies, as champions, because I think one of the things that I see is that so long as it's relegated to a women's issue, mm -hmm. you have women out on campaigning, you have women on the street, actually the real power is often held not by those women on the street, it's held by men in offices. And so how do we either make space around the table Gentlemen. or... Gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was in Pakistan last week with the World Food Programme and um, uh, and we had been talking mm -hmm. about this, yeah. the question of, of, of men's Men. involvement. Yeah. Um, and in Islamabad, I sat in front of row after row of men, um, uh, a row of men in the health industry uh, talking about um, uh, women needing to be more informed uh, so that the uptake in family planning would, would be greater. Um, and in another ministry, uh, looking at this fantastic, innovative uh, water mechanism. It's like a wheelbarrow, and you can, you can push it along the ground. Um, and, uh, and I was told that, yes, so now it's going to be so much easier, and she doesn't need to carry it on her head. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, you, you, you challenge men, mm. and they laugh. I don't know. How do we move beyond that and I guess where you because you have been I guess you have 
you know, you've just come back from Pakistan where you met the prime minister there. You're in these, you know, you've been to Uganda, you've engaged with, with women's groups, you're working across all of these initiatives. And I guess where you have seen change, what do you think has brought about those change? Um, what has enabled it? How do we unlock it? Because I think, you know, you're speaking to a room of the converted who know that we're stuck. Um, and so how do we, where have you seen change and how has, how has that become possible? Um, uh, there are two bits yeah. here. One is which, uh, of which is that I really don't think we're going to see um, enough change or really substantive change mm. unless we do flip this whole thing on its head. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how much reform and change happens amongst UN agencies and the NGO community and so on, if the member states mm -hmm. don't change themselves. Yeah. Um, if the powers that be, the, the makeup of the Security Council has been the same more or less since 1946. You know, this, the, the, um, the fact that that governments, donor governments, are set up with a humanitarian stream and a development stream. Um, the work that I do with WFP, the number of times that I am told, oh, well, we don't fund um, uh, WFP because we only fund development things. You think, oh, you know, honestly, mm. it, I mean, it's, it's infuriating. We have created this system. Um, in, uh, in Madagascar, uh, a, a European diplomat complaining about the former government, um, that it was their fault that, um, that the donor community hadn't been able to step in uh, because there was a, a drought and emergency funds were needed. And, and that government um, should have done something different, but they didn't call an emergency. They didn't press that magic button that allowed the, un, the, the releasing of funds. But this is something that we have created. The drought happened. The need was there. But we sit in corridors of, of power or amongst the diplomatic community and a government and say, well, you didn't, you didn't say it was an emergency with a capital E, so there's nothing we can do. So I'm going to open it up. And we, we're in a room of... Um, oh, I have another part of it. Can I answer the other yes. bit, though? Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's a big <laughs> thing. Um, and... Um, uh, but in this long, so I was, was um, an intern at the UN when I was, was 19. I was on the plane when Martin came out of Baghdad after the, the, the bombing. You know, it's, this, is, this is years um, uh, of, of being in or around. Um, and uh, from a, a working point of view, and this isn't ass kissing, Valerie, <laughs> the best place that I have the most dynamic, energetic, um, committed place that I have ever had the privilege to work has been at WFP. And I think that part of that is because if you are dealing with, you're actually, mm. when it comes to food and nutrition, you're dealing with a person. There's nothing abstract about it. You can't say, oh, we built a school. Uh, oh, there are 70 children in that school with one untrained teacher. There's not a box you can tick. You are malnourished or you're not. You have been fed or you haven't. And there's, there's an immediacy there. Um, there is an understanding of... Okay, so why are you malnourished? Oh, well, now I have to look at your, your livelihood and then the things that are distracting the, the weather, all of these things. And that, um, that sort of level of, of humanity mm -hmm, and complexity mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, has sort of driven what I have seen, particularly in the field, is, um, is a responsive, dynamic group. That so that really urgency, keeps getting out there. that yes. urgency is prompting. A, a, you can't, a you can't step yeah. back yeah. from that. Yeah. Because it, it, it's happening or it's not. Mm. So <laughs> opening it up to the the wider room, as I was saying, we have you know lots of gender experts and humanitarian, you know, long standing humanitarian experts in the room, and I guess I'd want to open up this conversation um, and to keep it as a conversation. So. 
you know, we're hearing that the humanitarian system is failing. Do you agree? Is this resonating with you? Is this something you're seeing in your work? You know, you've been working on gender issues and humanitarian issues for, for decades. So what do you see as some of the solutions? And I, and I guess coming back to you, we have someone here with, with access, with diplomatic power and with, with the ear of governments. And how do we work with, you know, the, I guess, the experts in the room and bring, bring us together for a constituency that can see a real change? So over to you for comments, for questions. We have a, a question over here maybe first and then... Another one here, and yep, yeah, another one here. So I don't know who's. Hello, my name's Daphne Jaya Singha. I'm the head of policy at the International Rescue Committee, and I'm on the board of the Gender and Development Network. Thank you very much for your comments and your strong and very powerful message um, about a gender equality revolution. I just wanted to say how much many of the themes resonated with the work we're doing at the International Rescue Committee and just highlight a few that were particularly powerful for me. Um, firstly, just on the imbalance that you identified between humanitarian funding and prevention of maternal deaths, but of also of, of gender-based violence with the rates of gender-based violence that we, are, we have known for, for decades. Uh, we at the IRC have, have estimated that... Um, uh, funding to GBV prevention between 2016 and 2018 was at just 0.2%, which it is certainly an imbalance and disproportionate. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about your call for a, a transformative agenda, which really appreciated. Um, that resonates very much with the IRC. We're integrating a, a feminist approach in our humanitarian um, a approach to humanitarianism and that's something that our CEO David Miliband has been very outspoken about and I think that's a real call to action to the sector to kind of understand that what we're looking for isn't uh, isn't quick fixes it's transformation that takes time and that brings me on to the third point that you made so well around the importance of multi-year flexible financing because these are complicated issues because addressing gender inequality that is at the heart of all of the problems that you de defined takes time. Um, there is a dire need for multi-year flexible financing that reaches women's organizations um, and particular fem particularly feminist, feminist organizations. Um, I suppose I did have a question around, yeah. around uh, women's economic empowerment. I was really interested in your point about the, dif the distinction between the focus that's tended to be on the individual rather than the collective. And I, I was curious about your ideas about access to decent work, particularly for those most marginalized communities like the refugees that we work with. Excellent. Thank you. And yeah, I don't know where the mic is, but maybe Nicola. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Nicola Jones. I'm based here at ODI, and I direct the Diffid Fund of Gender and Adolescence Global Evidence uh, Program. Uh, we're carrying out longitudinal research with adolescent girls and boys in humanitarian and in developmental contexts. And I think what really resonated for me was your focus on needing to take seriously the leave no one behind agenda and to think about accountability towards those cohorts. Um, I think one of the, the striking things uh, that we need to all be thinking about um, as we go into the SDG uh, plus five review next year and also the, the Beijing um, 25th anniversary, the Beijing Platform for Action, is the fact that we're still uh, not uh, counting the, the gaps. So, for example, if you look at the adolescent uh, population, so young people between 10 and 19 years, only 18 of the 232 targets of the SDGs are disaggregated by, by gender and age. So, you know, back to your point about silos, how do we really know uh, the silences in the service delivery if we're not measuring it? You see the same thing very much reflected in the voluntary national reviews that countries are doing in terms of SDG reporting. There's no standard protocol. There's no um, guidance in terms of how we should be uh, you know, holding um, states to, to account in, in terms of progress across all of those, those goals and targets, and particularly for those who are being left behind. So 
uh, I'd very much like to hear your thoughts on how we can advance that agenda and really stop the rhetoric and see some progress towards leaving no one behind. I would make a special plea in that to really then thinking about um, married girls or ever married young people. There's just huge vulnerabilities, um, particularly in humanitarian contexts, uh, that we need to pay much more attention to. Okay, great. Yeah. So just. Quite loud. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, thank you very much for such a passionate um, speech. My question to you is very simple, especially coming from the Arab world where there is a track record of failed revolutions, and you're calling for a gender equality revolution. Who's going to lead that revolution from your perspective? And could it be a leaderless revolution? Who are the key actors who are going to take up that very interesting agenda call for action that you've outlined? Thank you. So interesting. I think we take one more. Yes, we have. Uh, hello, ma'am. So uh, my question is regarding the, you mentioned uh, something about the collective action towards transforming the power relations. Uh, I understand that the times of humanitarian crisis, you provide, you have an opening to change the, transform the power relations. But what do you mean by when you say the collective action to transform the power relations? Uh, because at the times of the crisis, even though it provides the opening, you can't really disturb the, uh, how can I say the, the aspect, the ground reality of the situations where if you try to do the external power, power relation change, that doesn't work. So, how, what do you mean by when you say the collective action towards the power relations? Thank you. So lots of great questions. Run around decent work for, for women and girls. Other about the, the SDGs and how do we actually you know, drive that forward? Um, can we have a leaderless revolution? And given that revolutions have not necessarily been so successful in the Arab world, how do we move forward? Um, and yeah, how, do, how can we transform power relations at, at a local level? So maybe you can bring some of those together, if you like, as well. Try very humbly <laughs> and, and encourage anybody else that, that has answers for all of this, please, to also um, uh, say something. Um, uh, question number one and question <coughs> number five <laughs> um, uh, about um, uh, the gender uh, revolution and, and how. Um, the president of uh, the international um, international Co international women's health coalition IWHC, um, Francois somebody has just written um, a fantastic piece on um, on the women's on, on this business of investing in in the individual action of women and not uh, the collective mm -hmm. efforts that are required and which is shoring up women's groups and, uh, and trying to, to totally disrupt this, this imbalance of, of our not providing the funding. Um, again, long-term, flexible, predictable funding so that um, the, the grassroots, women-led uh, civil society organizations can actually thrive and they can grow and they can strengthen um, that uh, that they're not bogged down by um, uh, by request to try and get money that they can actually um, be guided get the technical assistance that they need if the problem is that that their accounting isn't up to scratch or we don't think that they're trustworthy for our funds, then our job, surely, should be to step in and, and shore up the skills that they lack. Um, uh, but but the, the point that um, Francoise makes in, in her article is that, um, first of all, this sort of change takes time. And again, the way that we fund doesn't do that. And that... Um, that there are these these pillars, these spikes. Um, uh, you have the, the glass ceiling, but much mm -hmm. more significantly, you have the sticky floor. Um, and all of the things in a, in a woman and girl's life that keep 
pulling her back, the discrimination, the public transport, the, um, the lack of legal justice, uh, going to the police who don't believe that, um, uh, that you can have rape in marriage, or, or the banking laws and requirements for, for women and so on. These are the kind of systemic things that have to be changed, that are not going to be changed. We're never going to deal with that sticky floor if we just you know, piecemeal one woman um, by another. Um, uh, leaders of the revolution. It's fascinating to see what's happening at the moment um, in the Middle East because we've, we've got this, we've got people out on the streets and they're not going away. Um, uh, even when they're being being uh, fired at and and bombarded, um, I absolutely don't have an answer. And I wish that there were voices out there that um, that could guide this, <coughs> because where is it going otherwise? Um, um, a theory that I have um, is uh, particularly in. Uh, say the the Arab countries. If you don't want to be Western, your only other alternative is to be more Muslim, because there's nothing in between. There's there's never been a, a political discourse, a philosophy of of movements and politics and so on, because it's never been allowed. So what is the other legitimate thing that exists? Is the religion, um, is that sort of institution? Um, so I don't know where when it's, you know, 60%, um, over 60% of that population is under the age of 30. Mm. You know, I, they're, not going to, they're not going to go quietly this time. Um, and, um, and I hope that someone steps up, multiple people step up very soon and help guide this to somewhere that is not going to be more violence and, um, and so on. Um, for for the rest of it, though, a lot of the things that I talked about are things in a system that we have made, that we maintain. The way that that governments have the humanitarian and the and the development, uh, the the silos, the the thematic silos, um, that we give in to the rhetoric constantly. Uh, that we, this sort of celebration that happens all the time about the progress, which is amazing. The, the work that people have done, the dedication, unbelievable. Now let's move on. Because if, you're, if this is what you do, if there are people who are suffering, uh, if we are not reaching more people, then we are failing. Um, governments are failing, and we have to call them out. Uh, the, whether there be self-censorship, um, uh, the unwillingness to say some of the obvious things. Um, uh, what, do, what are we afraid of? You know, if we can't talk about sexual and reproductive health and rights, for example, how do we expect women and girls in these hardest of places to be able mm. to do it. Yeah. If I'm afraid of, of the big bad wolf, and this is, this is you know, that, that's the sort of thing about taking a stand and taking a side. I'm doing this work, and so I'm really going to do it, and I'm going to say what I see and call people out because I have a platform and an opportunity to do so. And so that's... Uh, that's how I'm going to try and move things forwards. Um. Excellent. So, oh, I'm getting told that we've got five more minutes, but we've got time for some more questions. We've got one over here, and then maybe Katie, and then a quick return back to you. Hi, my name is Tesney Mauji. I'm an independent consultant. Um, having worked in the humanitarian sector for a long time, um, you know, I think, <laughs> sadly, um, your first two pillars, the putting women and girls at the center and having um, flexible, predictable, multi-year financing, 
actually fall into the we know category um, that you identified. Yeah. Yes. We know. I'm not original. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I think it's really important because then it gives us the chance to say, well, if we know these things, why don't we change? Yeah. And that's where I think it's really interesting. The one thing I haven't heard mentioned here is this issue of vested interests. Mm -hmm. You know, there are vested interests in keeping the status quo. Whether that's, um, you know, your very startling sort of analogy of, you know, a woman's um, stomach belongs to one agency, you know, her ovaries belong to another agency because they have mandates, mm -hmm. you know, and, and absolutely you cannot cut across those. Um, donors have different budget lines and you cannot cut across yeah. those because there are vested interests that do not want these cut across. So the real thing, challenge is how do we challenge those vested interests and actually change those so that the interests of the people we're supposedly trying to help are actually at the front and center of what we do. And do you have any thoughts? Yes, on I how would we open that up for <laughs> the group because to answer. Because right, you know, we are. Yes. We are. We all agree, um, yeah. and we all are stuck. And I guess you know, uh, how do we change those vested interests? And do, I mean, from my sense, I do think there is an opportunity currently because, you know, on women and girls at least, there is a domestic agenda where this has risen to the fore. And I wonder, is there any way of capturing that political interest, which is, which is new? I mean, it's, I mean, there is a backslide, but it is new. And is there an opportunity to actually influence those vested interests, you know, so that we do, we do change it and there is more of a recognition of women and girls. I don't know what you think, but I think p potentially there's a, there's a glimmer of hope there. Maybe not the revolution that you're hoping and, uh, for, but maybe we can transform some of that. I come from a humanitarian financing background, so it comes back to the money. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's where you, the only way perhaps you can try and break some of these is if you get the money going in certain directions, it's how you focus the money. But that doesn't take care of the, the problem that there are vested interests within donor agencies that drive in different directions. And that's why you don't get the flexible, longer term funding, which actually would take, you know, should actually be dealing with a lot of the capacity strengthening, um, lifting up the women's groups, as you described, because the short term humanitarian financing is just not designed for that. Um, but if the two work together, um, then sure, we could move things forward a lot more. But but there are vested interests in keeping those things separate as well. And that I don't know how to break. I, I know that there's someone here from the Canadian mission in Geneva. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. But from a donor perspective, what do we need to do to change this? We've got it's lots very, of other donors. This is very, behind very, the very disruptive. Of, I should say I that. Just, no, so, but what do yeah. we have to... So we I just, guess, yeah, which of you, know, which of you will... You know we need... You know, you say that we have to be accountable, you say we have to be effective, you say you want to see results, then give us the tools so that this can happen. And, and if you... But if you don't, I mean, just... Let's just call the whole thing off. If, <laughs> unless you genuinely want to have impact, let us do our work. So why... What what keeps stopping this? I'm still looking at you because I don't know anybody else in the room. I'm sorry. No, we have <laughs> and we love brave, Canada. Canada's we have wonderful. a brave British government donor here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Swedish as well. So, Our favourite donors. <laughs> oh my God. Sarah, first of all, thank you very much for a very, very inspirational speech. I'm peaked to stand up if you like. <laughs> I was uh, provoked to stand up. I think it's worth saying oh, that in the same way that as humanitarians, we tend to think of the private sector as a monolithic block. The, it's just true that donors are not a monolithic block. And I would, if you could see the work that we do to try and convene a consensus, I think you'd understand that. It's not as if there is a massive block of donors that are all working in the same way. Mm -hmm. 
I regret to say this, but it's true. And so in a way, your political economy, if you like, isn't just a question of, oh gosh, lots of different NGOs and lots of different UN agencies. But the fact is that donors all have a slightly different perspective on things as well. So to think of the donors in one block is not quite correct. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, on a more flippant note, the revolution clearly starts with HPG. I was very interested to see that, <laughs> that out of the 23 staff you have, a mere four are male. <laughs> But those men are doing a fantastic job. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess we have uh, Lisa from Well, you know, well. since uh, well, I'm uh, from Sweden, then representing uh, CEDA, but I've also been uh, working on the Swedish work on flexible funding for you. So everything that you said is uh, music to my ears and we try to lead that revolution within donors together with Canada for example and on the grand bargain effectiveness agenda on ensuring better quality funding in terms of more flexible funding and more multi-year funding. So yeah just to share that we're doing what we can within our sphere of influence and trying to convince and as Sweden has taken a stand on uh, uh, also in practice of uh, last year, no, 2018, we started to provide a uh, number of uh, um, our f core funding to UN agencies. Mm -hmm. We provided four-year core support mm -hmm. to just allow yeah. what you had just been explaining. So uh, just to share that we're, we're really uh, on the same side here and really trying to make the system work much better. And on everything you've been say, in, saying on a gender equality revolution, we of course fully agree <coughs> since we are a feminist foreign policy country and we've been uh, as a permanent oh not permanent but uh, temporary tenure in the security council we were really also working hard on pushing the agenda for women peace and security thank so thank you very much for an excellent uh, and very very uh well necessary uh, speech tonight thank you very much thank you can i just because it is the canadians it is the brits it is the Sweden, Denmark, Norway. Um, am I forgetting any of the of the really sort of solid um, donors? That's a that's on one hand. So maybe the question back to you. First of all, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, what do you need from us to help you? Mm have a revolution with the other 185 you know how can we help you to to do more within your own governments and then you know making sure that other governments follow your fantastic example and and become engaged you know where where are other donor groups uh in these conversations and and so on um I shouldn't be rude to the people that are the ones that are really trying to do the work. So how do we help you? So Lisa, do you want to answer that? And then we'll come back and give you the final word to, to close, because I know some of No, but I think we've been discussing today also, yes. I mean, that outreach to whatever you label um, non-traditional or newer yes. donors. And I think that's, of course, uh, yeah, th that's where we could, uh, I think, create better alliances on how to influence uh, that's where not the usual suspect. So let's continue that work together. Okay. Yeah, and I think as um, as Colm said, certainly HPG um, is yeah. very interested to be part of this, both the women and the men. Um, so not just the, I don't think there was 20 women and four men. I think it's a little bit more gender balance than that. But um, but I guess what I'm hearing is that, you know, there's a, there, there's a constituency of the committed, there's political will, there's financial capital. It's just about how do we bring that together to really galvanize this and drive that forward. So I'll give you the, the last word. I'm afraid there were lots of questions coming in online that I ignored and I've cut off some other, other questions as well. But Princess Sarah, the last word. Just to say thank you. Um, thank you for the work that you do and you're going to keep doing. Uh, and, uh, and for the thought that all of you, the fact that you're here and, uh, and being so thoughtful about trying to 
uh, to change the uh, the systems that we all uh, the shackles and systems that we that we push against because by constantly challenging ourselves each other um, the system questioning everything that we see one of the great things about um, the traveling that I get to do is constantly having to to reassess what I think um, and and uh, being challenged by the endless complexity of individual lives, of the settings that humanitarian organizations operate in. Um, and, uh, and, and that has to be a constant, that we, that we not be afraid to, to make mistakes, to learn from them, um, <laughs> and, and just to keep uh, plowing onwards and continuing to have conversations that are that are different, um, and uh, and push boundaries in every single direction. I think that is is um, uh, that's that's what we have to be doing. And and I thank you very very much for this opportunity to um, uh, to share my thoughts about it. Well, thank you. This is a Thank you to all of you and to those of, of you online that I haven't given enough attention to. But yeah, a really important conversation that I think you've inspired and challenged us. Um, and I think you've been generous in terms of, of thanking us. But I think together there's much more we can do to drive forward this agenda. And definitely we in HPG intend to be really working on it for the next year. So we look forward to working with you and to others in the room as well on this really important agenda. So thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you very much.